Hola, and good afternoon. There is nothing more important than knowing who we are and how we got that way. And I'm going to explore these issues in a talk I've titled Ideas, Intuitions, and Images of Identical and Non-Identical Twins, What They Reveal About Human Behavior. I look at twins as scientific treasures because just by acting naturally in different research contexts, twins tell us so much about our human behavior and how we got that way. And there's also a very special class of twins, namely identical twins raised apart from birth who meet as adults. And these twins are in the rare position to see themselves, to look at each other as a life unlived, as a life and an identity they might have had had their situations been reversed. And I'll explore this topic and what it means for all of us later on. But for now, there are two types of twins, identical and fraternal. The identical twins result when a single fertilized egg divides between the first and 14th day after conception. And these twins share 100% of their genes in common. The fraternal twins result when two separately released eggs are fertilized. And these twins share half their genes on average, just like ordinary brothers and sisters. The fraternal twins can be either same sex or opposite sex. And I know that most people are drawn to the identical twins because of their visual interest. But I'm really captivated by the fraternal twins. Look at these two. The same sex pairs look so different, and the opposite sex pair looks so much alike. And in the next slide, you see another extraordinary version of fraternal twins. Both of these pairs were born to parents in which the mother and father were themselves the product of mixed marriages. These are naturally conceived fraternal twins, and I know other pairs like them. And it occurred to me that a wonderful research idea would be to study these twins, the life experiences of ordinary fraternal twins raised in the same family, growing up in the same community, but who appear to come from different ethnic groups. Now, the logic of the twin method is very simple and very elegant. And what we do is we study groups of identical twins and compare them to fraternal twins, with reference to a certain trait, such as height. And you can see here that these identical twins are just about the same height, whereas the fraternal twins are quite different. And this tells us that height is something that does have a substantial genetic component to it. But we can study twins in other ways. One of the most fascinating variations are identical twins who differ in some way, what we call co-twin control. I met these twins at a wedding. I'm always doing research. And I noticed how strikingly similar they were, but there were extraordinary differences. The twin on your right was heavier. She has a different dental structure. And I learned that she has breast cancer. So if we can decide or figure out what are the prenatal or postnatal factors that explain the differences in these identical twins, we can use that information to understand weight and dentition and the development of disease in non-twin populations. Identical twin families are extraordinary designs that come about when identical twins do something very ordinary, which is just marry and have children. And what makes them unusual is that the twin ants you see in this slide are not just the ants of their nieces and nephews, they're the genetic mothers, because the mother and the ant are genetically the same. The nieces and nephews are the genetic children of their ants, and the children from the two families are legal first cousins, but they're also have siblings because they share a parent who's genetically the same. It would be as if a woman had two husbands, two families, and had children with both of them. Researchers have used this design to explore genetic and environmental influences on behavior. I've used identical twin families and fraternal twin families to explore various kinship-related hypotheses, namely, are relationships between identical twin aunts and the nieces and nephews closer than those between fraternal twin aunts and uncles? And the answer is yes, they are. One of my favorite designs is called Twins as Couples, and I studied these twins and many others like them a number of years ago. What's fascinating about the Twins as Couples design is that you look at the social interactional processes and outcomes between twins working in various problem-solving situations. And here you see these identical twins working very happily at a puzzle completion task. But the fraternal twins are seated apart. They're differently engaged in the activity. And I saw this pattern repeated over many, many pairs like this. And what this suggests is that 
Perceptions of similarities in intelligence, personality, information processing strategies all combine in identicals for a more successful and more cooperative outcome. And I think that has implications for all of us, who our friends are, who we prefer to work with. So what do twin studies tell us overall? They tell us that virtually all traits are affected by genetic factors. And in this list, I've prepared the heritabilities or the degree of genetic influence for a number of traits that we've studied using twins. You see that height is largely genetically influenced, about 90%. This drops to 50 to 70 for general intelligence, 50 for special mental abilities, on down to about 30% for job satisfaction. But what do these numbers really mean? Because heritability is a very misunderstood trait. For height, it doesn't mean that 90% of a person's height is genetically influenced and 10% is environmentally influenced. What it means is that in a population of people, there's going to be variability in height. And 90% of the variability is associated with the genetic factors among those people, with the other 10% associated with the environmental differences between them, or perhaps some measurement error as well. And to say that a trait is genetically influenced does not mean that it can't be changed. Certainly through training and practice, we can change our personality to a degree, or we can become smarter to a degree. But not all traits can be changed easily some more easily than others, and not everybody's going to be the same. Not everybody responds to practice or training to the same degree. Now, another way to study twins is through identical twins raised apart from birth, who meet as adults, and this gives us a pure estimate of genetic influence. The Minnesota study of twins raised apart, which began in 1979, is a landmark study. It is the most comprehensive study ever done in terms of psychology and medical assessment, not just for twins, but for any number of people. I was very privileged to work on this study for eight years between 1982 and 1991. And you see here a set of identical triplets raised apart from birth, didn't meet until they were 19 years old through mistaken identity. We studied 137 reared apart twin pairs, 81 identical and 56 fraternal. The mean age was about 42, but some were as young as 11, others as old as 77. They were separated as young as about a half a year, and some stayed together till about four and a half. And it was an entire week, a very intense psychological and medical assessment. On the first day, we took unposed photographs of the twins, meaning that they were given no instructions as to how to stand or hold their hands. Here's what we found. Identical twins invariably fall into similar postures, the way they hold their hands, the way they stand. And fraternal twins form into various other postures, very, very different from one another. Very striking difference. This suggests that for all of us, the way we sit, the way we stand, the way we move, largely a function of our genetics, the way that our bodies are put together. And I'll bet that if there are any identical twins out there, if you just look to your left or your right, your identical twin is probably sitting exactly as you are. This was mirrored on the set of the CBS program 48 Hours with Leslie Stahl. She's surrounded by five sets of identical twins raised apart. And without any instruction from anyone, the twins naturally fall into similar positions, the way they cross their legs, the way they hold their hands. Findings from the Minnesota study largely mirror those that I showed you earlier based on twins raised together. And that, to me, is one of the most important findings to emerge from psychology in the last 20 years. What it means is that what makes people in a family similar is not their shared environment, it's their shared genes. This does not mean the environment doesn't make a difference in our development, it does. But it's the... There we go. It's the, it's the unique environmental experiences that we have apart from our family members that are important. Now, identical twins raised apart are also a wonderful way to study twin relationships. We know that twins raised together, who are identical, are socially closer on average than those that are fraternal. But would it work that way for twins raised apart? I asked the twins. 80% of the identical twins said that they felt closer and more familiar towards their newly found twin than did the fraternal twins, where it was maybe 60%. The most interesting finding to emerge from this had to do with the fact that 20 to 30% of the twins 
said that the adopted siblings they were raised with all their lives were closer than best friends or as familiar than best friends. What that means is that just living with someone all your life doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a close relationship. It means that close relationships can evolve very, very quickly. And again, I think it's the perceptions of similarities that are the social glue, the proximal mechanisms that draw those identical twins together in such a very, very short time. I want to turn now to a very special pair of twins, separated at birth, Oscar and Jack, as a way of exploring issues of identity. Oscar and Jack were born to a Romanian Jewish father who was leaving his country to escape the anti-Semitism there, and to a Catholic German woman who we met on a ship, and they settled in Trinidad. In 1930, they had a little girl named Sonia, followed by identical twin boys, Oscar and Jack, in 1933. And when the parents' relationship soured, it was decided that the more even-tempered Jack would stay with his father to be raised Jewish in Trinidad, and the mother would take Sonia and Oscar back with her to Nazi Germany. You cannot imagine a more different set of circumstances than these particular twins were raised in. Their early childhood years had some similarities, but also some differences. Both of them were raised with a sister, Jack with a younger sister, Natasha, and Oscar with an older sister, Sonia. Jack was raised mostly by a very distant father. Oscar was raised by a very strict grandmother when his own mother left for Italy to take a job in another family. The middle childhood years were very, very different for these two. Jack was free to roam around Trinidad. He went swimming, he went sailing, he went fishing with his friends, many of whom were native children from the island. And Oscar was raised Catholic in a very strict household. And both of these twins, however, harbored fears. Jack was fearful that somebody in British-controlled Trinidad would discover his German roots. And Oscar worried that somebody in Nazi Germany would discover his Jewish roots. And in fact, the schoolmaster said to Oscar, isn't your last name, which was Yufi, Y-U-F-E, doesn't that mean Jew? And Oscar said, Oh no, he says, that's a French name. It means it's, it's pronounced Yufe. He thought quickly. More interesting than that is the way both of these twins dealt with this fear. Jack by becoming very pro British and Oscar by becoming very pro German. So the content of their actions was different, but the actions themselves were the same. When the twins were eight, they both learned they had an identical twin brother somewhere out there. And they thought a lot about this brother and what it might mean to, to meet someday but that was not going to happen for some time. In adolescence, Jack joined the Israeli Navy. Oscar began to work in the mines of Germany. And they had their first reunion at the age of 21 in 1954, when Jack and his new wife traveled to Germany and met Oscar. At the train station, the first thing Oscar did was to remove Jack's luggage tags because they said he was from Israel, and their mother had since remarried to a pro-Nazi husband. This reunion was very cold. They looked at each other with suspicion, and they regarded each other as enemies. They didn't speak the same language, and their political and historical understandings were quite different. So at the end of one week, they left with the idea that they probably would never see each other again. But they did. In 1979, they both decided it was time to perhaps reconcile, after all those years of silence, and they joined the Minnesota study of twins raised apart. And we found many similarities among them in terms of their intelligence and personality. Both were incredibly stubborn and self-righteous. Um, but they also had some amazing habits in common. Both used to collect rubber bands around their wrists. Both read books from back to front. Both thought it was funny to sneeze loudly in elevators. And both of them used to flush the toilet before and after using it. Now, there are not genes for such specific behaviors. But the fact that we see these similarities in, in identical twins and very infrequently in fraternals suggest that perhaps some genetic mechanisms are at play here. And at least that gives us a whole new domain to search for ideas to explain these kinds of behaviors. After leaving Minnesota, Jack and Oscar pursued a interesting love-hate relationship. They took seven trips together, sometimes alone, sometimes with their wives. And here you see Jack with Oscar in Germany and Oscar's identical twin daughters, uh, grandchildren, Anna and Kathy. And 
Oscar died in 1997. It was a terrible blow for Jack, who then began to discover his Trinidadian roots once again. The twins had a very important conversation before Oscar's death, and both of them knew that had their positions been reversed, they both would have ended up being the person whose point of view they most despised. And that's a fascinating discovery. We don't have the option of looking at ourselves as having lived another life, but all of us could have made choices. We could have married someone else, lived in another country, taken a different job, so we can imagine how our lives might have been. But for Oscar and Jack, they could actually know that they would have been the other one. And this recalls a comment by philosopher Dale Wright, who says that our self-understanding that grounds identity is largely context-dependent. I'm very thrilled that our own Andreas Romer is writing a play based on Oscar and Jack. He's basing this on an essay I wrote in my book, Indivisible by Two, which is out there in the bookstore. If you're interested, there is more information about that, and I have every confidence uh, Andreas will receive another award for that play. Another case of twins separated at birth occurs when they're accidentally switched. In this slide, you see uh, Brent and George, identical twins who were put into temporary foster care, along with a single boy named Marcus. When the twins' parents came to claim them at two months of age, the foster parents accidentally switched Brent with Marcus, sending a false fraternal twin pair home with the twins' parents, Brent and George, and sending, I'm sorry, Marcus and George, and sending Brent to the adoptive family that was intended for Marcus. Well, the, no one knew any better until the twins were 20 and met at Carleton University in Ottawa. It's a marvelous research experiment because it completely disentangles the genes in the environment. But in terms of the family relationships, these are not twin reunions that are celebrated. These kinds of discoveries destroy families, they shatter identities, and they unravel lives. Because parents realize a child that they could have raised and should have raised, they did not. And for Marcus, suddenly realizing in an instant, he didn't have the parents he thought he had, he did not have the twin he thought he had. In short, who was he? A year ago, I studied a similar pair in the Canary Islands in Spain. And I've just completed the first draft of a book that will be out next year called Someone Else's Twin, where I explore the various issues involved in twins who were accidentally separated and reunited as adults. I'll talk briefly about two current studies I'm conducting on virtual twins and young Chinese twins raised apart from birth. So virtual twins are a kinship I discovered a number of years ago, and they are unrelated children of the same age reared together in the same home. So they share the environment and they share the rearing situation just like twins. It's very twin-like, but they're not twins. The beauty of this design is that they give us a direct estimate of shared environmental effects. How do they come about? Parents adopt two ch children at the same time, or an infertile couple can't conceive, try to adopt, and then lo and behold become pregnant, as did the mother of these children. She tried to adopt a child, the process was ongoing, and she found herself pregnant with triplets. So this is a real gold mine for me because I could pair the adoptee with each one of these triplets for three sets of virtual twins. Now how similar are they? I studied 140 virtual twin pairs at the age of about a little over seven and a half. And what you see there are the correlations, the estimates of shared environmental influence, and they're only about a quarter for intelligence, weight, and height. I've paired those with the correlations or measures of similarity for fraternal twins who share environments and genes, and you can see that it's a lot higher for them than for the virtual twins. And what I found in my study, and what other adoption researchers have found, is that as children age, and start to go out on their own and move away from their families, that shared environmental influence begins to drop, and the similarity between them uh, almost disappears. I've been studying young Chinese twins adopted apart. This is the first prospective study of separated twins where you can actually track their development over time. And this comes about through the one-child policy that limits families to one child in urban areas, two children in rural areas. And I'm very excited about these findings, and I'm going to go on to the last slide, because I have one second left, and just say how impressed I continue to be with twin research. It, it just provides so much information that all of us can use, and I've been able to use some of this to assist twins in legal cases involving custody, injury, wrongful death, 
And again, I think it's just simply nature's finest experiment. Thank you all so much.